not quite out of the pandemic. We're not quite out of getting all back to work here. Where do you stand right now over at BMO? Yeah, so one of the things that I love about this is that we're actually getting together. Uh, we, uh, we do about 150 conferences a year at BMO, and they've all been virtual, even up till now. We've had a couple that didn't launch quite right. We couldn't get the right audience in the right place. And so to come down here and see this many people all engaged, all activated live, like it's, it's, it's very invigorating. Invigorating. What are the conversations that are being had at the moment? What do you think people want to question? Are they here to make deals? Are they here to wring their hands about inflation? What do they want? Um, one of the great things about Milken is it's an exchange of ideas. And you're not here just to do a deal. You're really here to take whatever knowledge base you have and move it a little bit further. And so I was on a panel this morning, and I can tell you I picked up some really great insights from the four people we were with and the way that they're thinking about sustainability, uh, live in action, and what they're doing to make change happen today. And some of those stories I hadn't heard before. So it was a great, great insight. Talk to us kind of about the state of the capital markets, particularly we've seen a lot of M&A activity, a lot of uh, public offerings, and of course a lot of private uh, equity deals as well. When you look at the health, you know, as a whole of capital yep. markets right now, where does it stand? Um, I would say the capital markets today are uh, in what I will, the end of the robust phase, right? We go through cycles over time, and today it is at its strongest, right? M&A is very strong, equity is strong, credit spreads are down, interest rates are down, and fears in the marketplace are actually quite low. Um, I think we're in a transition period. It feels over the last couple of weeks that people are starting to reevaluate whether that future is you know, simple and clean, or if we've actually got some headwinds coming our way, whether that's inflation, uh, whether it's commodity prices, whether it's the pace of the economic recovery. And so I think those are live conversations in the markets today, and we're going to watch those over the next few weeks. How real are those fears when you heard the bank earnings last week? Jamie Dimon was saying it's the media that's actually sensationalizing the inflation issue, the supply chain issue. Is it, or are you worried about those things? Yeah, I would say that we are uh, thoughtful about them today. I don't, I don't like the word worried, because uh, I think when you're running a markets business, you adapt to what the markets are doing. And so today we're watching those issues. Uh, particularly for me, inflation, I think, is the unknown. Is it transitory? Is there real core inflation? Supply chain issues should, in theory, get fixed. But they don't feel fixed today. Are clients worry about it? Yes. Yes. Client, all, all good investing clients worry about everything all the time. Yes. Right? That's what allows them to make money, is they think about risk, mm -hmm. they think about opportunity and balance those two things. And so, yeah, these are on their mind today. It's been interesting, though, that you've been here on a panel discussing sustainability, ESG focus. In some ways, says Sustainability is getting, well, the raw end of the deal when we're all talking about supply chain issues, energy crisis. Some are saying, look, it's the transition. That's why renewable investing hasn't been enough to offset some of the lack of investment in oil and gas. Is that the right perspective to have? Yes, it is. Uh, I think that uh, one of the dynamics whenever we go through big change, someone today said the sustainability or the climate revolution is the same as industrial revolution. And with that amount of change, you're going to have periods when it's in balance and periods when it gets out of balance. The energy question in the next few months is going to be one of those that's out of balance. And but well, with regards to how some of the new these new investments are being pitched, there's a lot of concerns about the transparency and knowing uh, sort of what e not only what the ESG factors are, but making sure that there's sort of a transparent way of yes, assessing whether those goals are being met. How do you do that? So I think one of the things that I, and I commented in my comments today that I'm actually really excited about is this concept of data and transparency and comparability. And so today when someone gets out and talks about how they're doing an ESG, they're actually defining their own framework. And when they're all different, you get into a conversation about is it the same, is it fair, where are we going? There's lots of work going into standards, lots of work going into data, and when we get to a place where they are comparable, uh, we'll all have a better sense of that. It's going to take years, by the way. It's not going to happen this quarter. But Europe's but, already trying. Yes. Right here, right now, they're setting standards, and it's actually impacting global investors with their marketing within Europe. Right. Is it making you change the way in which you market some of your ESG investments? Uh, I would say when we think about it as a principle as a bank, right, we're, we look at that as a win, not as a, a challenge, and that having those places where we have standardization, and you can look at all kinds of things across society where standardization actually creates the threat of innovation and change. And so what the Europeans are doing is trying to accelerate the conversation. Uh, I live up in Toronto, so most in Canada, we're trying to adapt as fast as we can. And when I think about our corporate clients, I don't know a single corporate client that isn't having this conversation at the border. Right? They're all there today thinking about how do they transition, what works for their company and their, their stakeholders. Are you seeing a major difference between Canada and the U.S. in their approach? Um, no, it's just different stages of the journey, right? Mm -hmm. Europe's ahead of the rest of us, right? Canada's been trying to catch up. U.S. is now catching up. And really what you have is when you've got someone who is the pioneer, as the fast follower, you get to accelerate quicker. So the U.S. now is accelerating rapidly in this topic.
the, there's no threat to the speed of the transition as you see it with suddenly perhaps you said there's this ongoing imbalance when we do have these revolutions in the market at the moment perhaps renewable investment hasn't been there to offset what is now a bit of a gap in oil and gas is there any way when we suddenly get worries about fears or as you say thoughtfulness about inflation thoughtfulness about some of the you know the end pullback of stimulus slightly does that in any way risk yeah, the, the amount of investment the real, the real derailer is public policy all right that's the derailer so if someone decides that it doesn't exist or they won't facilitate it that will then slow it down Right? But otherwise, natural economics are, and I, I talk about incentives a lot. So if you're a CEO today and you believe in smart transition, you're out looking at different things to do, and what they typically do is they actually cut your costs. Mm -hmm. right? And so all of a sudden, what you've done is I wanted to do good, and now my business is stronger, it's producing more cash flow, this is a great idea, so I'm going to do more of that. And that's the cycle I see today. I call it the incentive cycle or the virtuous circle. But public policy is obviously going to be a big part of this, whether we want it to be or not. How do you, I guess, bridge that gap? How do you have a relationship here um, with the government in a way that we get what we want? Or what we need? So I would say as a financial institution, we always constructively engage, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter who's in power. Uh, we have to have good relationships on what we think is smart policy. And so we active, you know, we activate around smart policy, and obviously there's that for the financial industry, but we also now activate around our clients. You know, once upon a time we had a very narrow band of who we thought a stakeholder is. Today we have a very broad band of what our stakeholders are, and that we need to advocate in those for those stakeholders. Dan, it's been so good speaking to you. Loving the no tie, long hair policy, <laughs> post COVID policy, he tells us. Go Dan Barkley's wife, who's insisted on no haircuts. BMO, Capital Market CEO. What a thoughtful conversation.